As long as I can remember, depression has made me feel like there were gray clouds following me everywhere. The depression and anxiety impacted my self-confidence, but I often got reminders from my father that I deserved to be seen. There was no reason I should doubt myself as often as I did in his eyes. I was 25 when I lost my dad. Grief coupled with the traumatic experience of going to trial to get justice for his death turned the gray clouds that followed me into a typhoon. My dad had been driving home on his motorcycle. There were three cars in the left turn lane going west at the intersection of Balboa Avenue and Mount Everest Avenue. The one in the middle was 27-year-old San Diego police officer Michael Justin Bruce in a police SUV. Bruce was called to assist with a hit and run, according to his deposition. Bruce turned on his lights, said he couldn't remember if he turned on his sirens, witnesses deposed said he didn't, and swung his SUV around the car in front of him and accelerated into the intersection while he still had a red light. At the same time, my dad entered the intersection on his motorcycle. Two years after that accident, I ended up in that courtroom when my family decided to sue the city of San Diego. After years of legal fuckery of submitting various documents to various courts, the city admitted liability. The move meant a jury would only be able to decide the amount of damages we'd receive. I was 27 years old when I walked to the front of the courtroom and took my seat at the stand. I looked back at the courtroom that was staring at me. I felt like I could see everyone and everything clearly. The defense attorney walked over to her place at the podium. A reptilian smile stretched across her leathery orange skin. It was as nearly distracting as the lime green lady suit with matching platform stripper heels she was wearing. Bracing myself for cross-examination, I knew she would try to make me look bad. She tried to claim that my father's death didn't impact me that much, and I was just a fuck-up that wanted money. She dug into my education, specifically classes I took for my political science degree. You took classes on fascism and nationalism, she inquired. The defense zeroed in on my career how I wanted to be a journalist and seemed to imply that I'd been trying without avail to make it even before my father died. My lawyer later explained that defense was trying to demonstrate that I couldn't keep a job and therefore the death of my father hadn't damaged me physically or psychologically, meaning I already sucked to begin with. The fascism questions I don't know what she was trying to say, maybe if I was a fascist or a nationalist. Either way, her cross-examination questions were meant to inflame the jury, so they'd hate me and award me fewer damages. Bruce was in the courtroom galley wearing a navy blue suit. I stared at him, wanting him to feel the same discomfort I felt. He stared straight ahead, avoiding my gaze. I knew she was just doing her job, but it was very hard not to internalize the defense attorney's remarks. It would come back to haunt me for days on end, challenging my self-confidence, and later send me on a bout of imposter syndrome. I heard of this term before, but I didn't realize it was happening to me. Imposter syndrome is described as chronic self-doubt, and intellectual fraudulence that persist despite accomplishments. The Monday after the trial's closing arguments, my family gathered in our lawyer's office to await the jury's deliberation on the amount of damages we were to be awarded. We were gearing up for a long wait when we received a call telling us the jury was ready for us. I worried as we hustled down the street to the courthouse. How could they make a huge decision that quickly, I thought. 
Like the various dramas I've watched on TV, the, George, the judge said something along the lines of, so the jury has come to a decision. And the lead jury member, a white middle-aged man in cargo shorts that looked like he should have been making a weekend run to Home Depot, not attending a wrongful death trial, handed over a folder containing the results of their few hours of deliberation. The court clerk read the amount of damages out loud, which sounded really low. It was closer to what the defense had prompted the jury to award us, basically an amount less than what it took to maintain the Miramar landfill, but higher than what she had asked. The defense came to their suggestion using a weird methodology based kind of on what my dad made during his career and then her own personal opinion. The jury's decision made me think the defense's disparaging remarks of my family and I were legitimate. All I could think was, we were wrong. The jury thinks we're wrong. Outside the courtroom, the defense attorney listened to the jurors explain their reasoning for picking the damage amount. We did what made sense. I heard the man in cargo shorts say, matter of factly. What made sense, cargo shorts? That my dad's life was reduced to what they thought his paycheck might have been? The defense's assassination of my career, education, lifestyle? The way she made it seem like spending money on a handful of Europe trips is a crime? The fact we even tried to get justice. It was a question that kept me up for nights on end post-trial. It was a question that made me wonder out loud when I was by myself. I'd imagine answering the defense's questions differently, maybe berating her or making fun of her weird outfits. It was a question that exacerbated the anxiety and depression I already had. One day, my lack of self-confidence coupled with anxiety and depression made me do something I thought was the biggest mistake of my life at the time. I was 29 when I started working as a reporter for a small business weekly. I should have been excited, but I couldn't help but feel like an imposter. All the other jobs I had applied to had rejected me. How could this place possibly want me when no one else, not even jurors at our trial, believed in me, I wonder. This responsibility awarded me, awarded to me worsened my anxiety. I thought that the feeling would leave, but I started to wake up to mild panic attacks each morning. I'd spend some moments hovering over the porcelain crown for an anxiety-induced throw obsession. I could go to work eventually, but the morning, morning terrors got worse. I don't deserve this, I kept thinking. I shouldn't be here. Then my anxiety culminated into a full-blown panic mode when I had to cancel a reporting trip one day. I was nearly at my destination when I needed to U-turn and drive home when anxiety overcame me. At home, I succumbed to a panic attack that kept me up the entire night. I called my editor the next morning and awkwardly explained I had a panic attack and that I was going to the doctor before returning to work. The doctor prescribed Zoloft, which is used for treating depression and anxiety, as well as Xanax. The Xanax had immediate effects, stopping shallow breathing and mind racing panic attacks produced. But the trade-off was that it made me too sleepy to work or drive. Zoloft, however, takes a while to set in. No therapists were available for immediate appointments, which made matters even worse. My anxiety raged on till I was having a week-long panic attack. I couldn't bring myself to go to the office. I began losing weight quickly as I had to vomit constantly from anxiety. I began to feel like I was gonna die if this continued. So I called the office and quit. The anxiety left, but a nearly equally unbearable shame took its place. 
It took quitting a job I wanted to realize how much the trial impacted me. The people in the trial, the defense attorney and jury, they were just doing their jobs, but their jobs crippled me. They made me doubt my abilities so much that I threw away the only opportunity I felt like I had at the time. Recovering from the shame was hard at first, but slowly, I started to feel like my old self again. I eventually had enough serotonin in my body from the Zoloft that it began to take effect. Seeing a therapist every other week gave me perspective on my issues and encouraged self-confidence. I got the job I had before the Business Weekly back. Having a familiar routine made me feel normal again. There was a glimmer of hope between the gray clouds, a chance I could transform and change. Once that happened, I started to thrive. I found a better paying job writing. I got my own column in the local Alt Weekly, won an award for an article, and wrote things I was really proud of. I also started realizing that I deserve more. That new job was okay, but I knew I was good enough to be published in big magazines and publications, and I could win more awards. When rejections happened, my treatment softened the blow to my ego. What the defense thought, whatever the jury thought, those were just people doing their jobs. This was something I knew at the time, but wasn't something I truly believed. I still have some bad days, of course, but there's usually always a silver lining, even on the gloomiest of days.